and welcome to Building High Performance Cultures, a weekly series where we talk to executives from top organizations about how they built high performance cultures and how they're leveraging their cultures as competitive advantage. I'm Marty Parker, the president and CEO of Waterstone Human Capital, and my guest today is the president of Loblaw Company Limited, Sarah Davis. Sarah, welcome to Building High Performance Cultures. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Sarah was appointed president of Loblaw Company Limited in January 2017, overseeing the day-to-day -day operations of Canada's largest retailer and the nation's food and pharmacy leader. With more than 2,400 corporate, franchised, and associate-owned locations, Loblaw, its franchisees, and associate owners employ approximately 200,000 full and part-time employees, making it one of Canada's largest private sector employers. Now, Sarah joined in 2007, and prior to assuming the role of president, she served as chief financial officer and chief administrative officer responsible for real estate, strategy, information technology, supply chain, and human resources. She has a strong corporate finance background, which has served her well in supporting some of the company's most transformative programs in recent history, including the implementation of SAP, the creation of Choice Properties REIT, and the acquisition of Shoppers Drug Mart. Sarah is also the chair of PC Children's Charity and TNT Supermarkets, and has served as the chair of the Women at Loblaw Network from 2009 to 2017. She also sits on the board of directors for PC Financial and AGF Investments. And of course, she's helped lead the Loblaw team to its 2020 Canada's Most Admired Corporate Cultures Award win. Sarah, if you would describe the corporate culture at Loblaw Company Limited and talk a little bit about your role in shaping that culture. Yeah, okay, well, thanks, Marty, and uh, thanks for that uh, long, uh, <laughs> descriptive introduction. Um, that's great. So I would say for us, Loblaw is a complex organization. As you highlighted, we have about almost 200,000 colleagues um, across our five divisions and business lines, and we're focused on everything from groceries to pharmacy, apparel to banking. Um, but we have a single pur purpose as a company, a central purpose, and that's to help Canadians live life well. So every division and every individual within that division is encouraged to, to, encouraged to think of their job through that lens and to ask themselves whether in all they do, are they helping their customers live the life they want to live? Uh, so from that, we promote our core values. So we have four core values. Those are care, ownership, respect, and excellence. And ultimately, these are the characteristics that help people run the businesses as well. And then within our core values, we actually think that they come to life in a certain culture. So we have core values, and then we have a culture that we encourage people uh, to live by. And our culture has basically sort of a human commitment to three things, which is first to make connections. Uh, so we encourage people to make connections every day, uh, to build trust, and then to be authentic. So it really is how do you bring your true self uh, to work every day. And I think in order for our culture to truly perme permeate through a business, um, it needs to be super important at every level. So, you know, from my, my, from me, from my management team to everyone throughout the business as well. So that's sort of how we bring culture to life um, at Loblaws. And that's a lot. Now, how has, I mean, Loblaw has grown in, an incredible amount in recent years. And it, that's a theme that has existed for a long time. But how has the culture evolved as the company has grown? Yeah, it's really interesting because we are a large employer and we have, and we've been around a really long time. So we're like a century old. Um, and I think our culture would have been quite traditional and sort of evolved through time. And it wasn't sort of a co conscious thing that we thought about until 2014. I would have said that was really when we decided to make the decision that culture was gonna be central to our company strategy. And at that time, our culture was, I would have said it was unintentional with norms that reflected you know, the company's past and not necessarily our future. So we asked our leaders and hundreds and hundreds of our colleagues company-wide how we should shape our culture. And what did we want it to be like? We did surveys and we did working groups and they were all clear. So people wanted it to be collaborative, they wanted it to be innovative. They wanted to feel connected. And then our acquisition of Shoppers Drug Mart 
shortly after that time made the culture even more important and even more relevant to ensure we could bring these two big organizations together. So it wasn't necessarily about, oh, well, this is the Loblaw culture and, oh, this is the shoppers culture. It was very much, how do we build a culture together that was our culture, the culture that all of us wanted um, together as well. So in the years since that time, our workforce surveys suggest that we have undergone a mass shift in mindset with these traits becoming our new normal. And our progress on culture is driven by two factors. So first we have communicated and communicated and communicated, so relentlessly. And second, we established early on the need to provide people clear culture expectations. Uh, so what was expected of people, what was you know, not expected of people, and we're very clear about that too. And then I would say, since our culture journey began, we've measured at every step of the way. So we had a lot of measurement in place. We used surveys to establish the ideal culture and to stay on the right path. And then in 2019, we actually added a culture index to our standard engagement surveys. So we've been doing engagement surveys over multiple, many, 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 many years, but we actually added a culture index in 2019, which are both annual and pulse throughout the year. So, and then each annual survey requires a departmental action plan. So if you don't have the culture that you need, you have to actually do something about it. And survey results allow leaders to target positive or problem areas, and then to set the numeric goals for people too. So it's, you know, culture, you know, you don't normally think of as being necessarily a numeric thing, but for us, we have made it so, so that we can track it and we can make sure that we stay um, true to who, what, who we want to be as an organization. What have you found to be the outcomes of actually measuring culture uh, now uh, and kind of measuring against that ideal that you set out to work towards? Yeah, I would say that for us, uh, and because I come from a background of finance, I really do, and I fundamentally do believe that you know, what gets measured is um, something that you can make change through. And if you don't have any type of measurement, super hard um, to see the change. So I think for us, having those measurement um, in place, talking to the people who are living it day to day in their lives, the colleagues there, you know, the data doesn't lie to you. You really do get a true picture of whether you are making the changes that you set out to do um, or whether you didn't and where the areas are. And so, you know, it's not about, you know, it really is about focusing on the areas that have issues and understanding why other areas have been so very, very successful and just sharing the learnings and, you know, continuing to improve every year would be sort of what we've done. And I think the measurement's key. Yeah, no question. And you've taken it to what I would call a next level because not as many organizations as we might think actually, you know, paint the picture of their ideal culture. And to do it through two very significant organizations coming together is a massive undertaking. So kudos for that. Also love to hear a little bit uh, about your organization's purpose of helping Canadians live well and how you've been able to leverage that purpose across you know, key functions like recruitment, retention, and recognizing uh, people who kind of live that purpose. Well, I would say our purpose has been around for quite a long time. I would say we sort of reestablished it probably in 2005 or six. Um, but last year in 2020, we really, at the beginning of the year, I thought, I really, really want to be a purpose-driven organization. We'd all sort of rallied around it. And we really did make do quite a bit of work to actually relaunch the purpose um, in 20, to the beginning of 2020, so prior to COVID. Um, and we thought, okay, we're really gonna go out there. I went, tried to talk to every colleague in the business that I could get to. I went to every you know, year beginning meeting and talked about, we did this video that made you really feel our purpose and what we were all there for. And we really put a renewed energy into it to ensure that everyone throughout the business understood it and what it felt like to be part of that. And basically having every colleague ask, how can I help? And what can I do to help you live your life well? So really customer centric, um, very much trying to make Canadians lives just that much better. And I would say when we, and of course COVID brought it to life more than anyone could have ever imagined where people really felt that our, we became an essential service and our purpose to help Canadians live life well was so fundamental to how we brought things, you know, essential services, both food and uh, health services to Canadians. So obviously I, I didn't know that when we were launching, but it was unbelievable the way that it actually came to life. And how we best recruit talent, we often do launch those branding messages internally first. 
to say, how does it resonate? Is it really true? Like, is that something that, you know, we're feeling? It's not just, uh, you know, me saying these things. Do people feel it throughout the organization? And make sure that it is, that it's super honest and that when we get people to go and recruit, that they can say these things with uh, honesty and say, this is why, you know, it's a great place to work. This is why it matters. We're living to help Canadians. Um, don't you want to be part of that? Um, and so I would say that certainly we would find out what appeals most to colleagues and make sure that that would be part of the messaging as well. And I would say our existing colleagues are our greatest asset. So having them be part of the process of bringing in others to enlist them in the recruiting process. Um, we can provide the social networking um, training so people know how to reach out to their networks. So that would all be part of the key. But having people, our own colleagues, um, feel the purpose is the first step, and then it makes it easier for them to then reach out and recruit across the business as well. And so that would be, you know, our technique uh, for bringing it to life and to bring it to recruiting as well. Well, I don't think you could have picked a better time. <laughs> it's true. Put the focus on purpose than uh, starting in January of 2020. Um, people are going to start to ask questions of your ability to see the future if you keep keep up that. <laughs> um, Talk about the Loblaw uh, colleague value proposition, if you will, Sarah, and, and what role does it truly play in Loblaw's high performance culture? Yeah, I would say that our purpose to help Canadians live life well obviously applies to our colleagues as well. And certainly for me, I want our colleagues, my ultimate goal, and I wouldn't say that I'm there yet, but my ultimate goal is to love, is for everybody to love coming to work every single day. And I would love our customers, of course, to love coming into our stores, or to shop with us on our websites and for you know that's my ideal and so how do we do that um, and so giving everyone a singular purpose streamlines the decision making um, is what I'm going to do in my daily activities ultimately going to help Canadians so it's a question you can always ask are you working on things that you sort of think I don't feel like this is customer centric like that's what I want people to be thinking about and, and having a simple purpose like just helping Canadians live life well it's simple it's easy for people to understand and to live by as well and then it also gives people a sense of being part of something bigger something that can really impact you know, Canada, if you really are thinking about it saying, I'm providing, you know, Canadians with their essentials, I'm providing an opportunity for Canadians to be healthier, offering them fresh, healthy food, offering them, you know, health services that will ultimately make, you know, their lives better. It's actually pretty powerful. And, uh, you know, it's a little different than just saying, yeah, we sell groceries, right? So it really is, yes, we do sell groceries, but we're also doing it uh, to help Canadians. You bet. Now, we talked about this in your introduction, but you've overseen a number of truly innovative and transformative projects in your time with the company. Um, but I'd love for you to talk a little bit about the role that innovation plays at Lavla and how you promote and reward innovation uh, across your, your colleagues and team members. Yeah, and I would say that our stores and our company have always been about innovation and customer centricity. I think it is what has allowed the company to basically stay alive and prosper for you know over a hundred years. Um, we believe that we've always been anticipating the needs of our customers and never been satisfied with the status quo. So I do feel like that's part of our history. It's part of our DNA. And when you look at some of the Lava's you know, first stores opened back in 1919. It offered Canadians a new way to grocery shop. So that the store introduced a concept of a self-service where it used to be you'd have a butcher and a baker that would all be separate stores. And then you would basically, or you'd have a store where you'd go in and have a counter where you'd ask for things. Ours was actually the first one where you actually went into a store and you self-served. You actually went around and you grocery shopped in the way that we do today. Um, which was super radical at the time. And then over the years, we've continued to lead in the evolution of the grocery experience, I would say. So I would say for us now being part of everyday digital retail, being a digital retailer, having a complete passion for our customers are key pieces to the company's strategy. And then last summer, we opened a new building in downtown Toronto. So one that I, I think it sort of reflects who we are as a company. It's at Bathurst and Lakeshore. Um, and it's a part of Loblaw's history because it's a old historic building um, and it has 
a new Loblaws concept store in it, as well as a shoppers, as well as our sort of office that will be for all, you know, digital, as well as sort of the payments team and some of our more, you know, the downtown Toronto, more innovative teams as well. And so for me, it is like a representation of what we are, that deep, 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 rich history, as well as um, some new concepts and some new teams living all together in one building. Um, it's ad it'll be an agile office. It is agile. We're not actually working in it yet um, because of COVID, but we will be able to. Um, and so for me, it's we've always been about an innovation. We show it in a bunch of different ways. Um, Cross-functionally, we have a you know an Amplify event, which is all it's sort of an IT tech event where we um, we have people hackathons where people have problems to solve um, and very, very energetic um, and youthful and fun um, way of looking at ways to solve problems for Loblaw as well. So lots of different things across the business about being innovative um, as well. So and we have like we involve lots of people across our business in our annual strategy sessions as well. So really trying to focus on, you know, young people as well as having different ways of thinking um, and then having fun ways to bring problems and solutions to life. Very cool. I haven't seen the store, but I've heard about it. I've heard it's, it's really nice. You should go visit. It's a nice one. Well, I've heard it's fantastic. So in addition to being an innovative organization, Sarah, um, Blah Blah puts a real premium on learning and development in the organization. And, um, and you know, that could be reskilling or upskilling team, uh, team members or colleagues. Why is that such a fundamental part of the organizational culture? And what are some of the ways that you, uh, you really promote learning internally? Yeah, I would say that we have a pretty good track record of skilling and reskilling. And I think we all need to accept and understand that the jobs of the past are going to be different in the future. And they've always been that way. Um, and so I know lots of people talk about new technology and how it's going to kill jobs and all of that. And I think in some cases, yeah, that's absolutely true. Even if you think of something as simple as a self-checkout in our stores, we sometimes have people who are concerned about that because it means that, you know, you won't have a cashier. Well, for us, it's about, yes, that's true, but we can evolve to have a new type of role. And for us, that could be something as simple as now we have pickers in our stores who are picking for groceries, um, which was a job that didn't exist, you know, before. We have lots of digital jobs. We have lots of data jobs. And so I really do think that it's really important for our business to reinvent itself and not stay in the past. Our competitors never will. We're always going to have new competitors. So we have to stay relevant as well. And so for a big part of that for us is to make sure that we know we know where the jobs are going and we make sure that our, our colleagues and our employees are ready to make the change, that they have the skills required. Um, in some cases, we have examples where we're actually teaching you know, coding skills to store colleagues so that if we know that there's more jobs in data and analytics, then we make sure that we have the skills. We have our own um, data and analytics sort of academy where different people at different levels can take different ones because we know that those are some of the skills of the future. So for sure, we do want to have people working on it. Um, we had 2000 colleagues participating in our internal skills program. Um, and when you think about our executive pipeline, it offers a nice proof point. So all of the past 11 additions to our 12 person executive management team have come from within Loblaws. So we really do believe um, that we should pro promote from within if we can. Um, and we do believe in longevity. We have people who've worked in our business for like 40, 50, even 50 years. We have people who are still working um, in our business. So I think in order to have that type of loyalty and that type of, it's not common anymore. And I think you can only do it if you make sure that your colleagues have the right skills for the future. So a big part of who we are as a business. Yeah, you bet. And this is a perfect uh, transition to the next question because you've been with the company since, as we mentioned, 2007. And your journey within the company really speaks to strong leadership development, succession planning type programming. You're the beneficiary and them, and them of, of you. So what have you learned, both as someone who's been on and through the leadership track up to, up to president of the business, but also, you know, as an executive looking to support the next or a new generation of leaders about the importance to taking a deliberate approach to leadership development and succession planning? 
Yeah, I think absolutely. Um, it is the role of the organization and the management team to take a strong um, position in that. And then I also think it's the role of the individual. So every person has to, like I do encourage people to own their own development as well. I think it has to be two pronged. It has to come from the organization. It has to come from the person as well. So as an organization, we need to understand the different ways that people progress in their careers. Uh, whether, sorry, something fell. Uh, so whether they, how they progress in their careers, some people need to be pushed. Um, traditionally, we would say women maybe need to be pushed. Maybe don't put their hands up um, as often as men, perhaps. Um, I don't think there's always one type of woman or one type of man, but I think on the spectrum, sometimes that is true. So, but I think as a management team, you have to understand the differences between different people um, and make sure the opportunities are there and how you, you address them different, differently. I think that always involves having a good performance management culture, having a good succession planning structure. And then I would encourage the you know, the individuals in our business to also be responsible for their own development. You can't sit back and assume that your manager is going to do everything and develop you the way that they need, you need to be developed. You have to make sure that you are taking that on as well. And I think you have to be adaptable. You have to be flexible. You have to be open-minded. Maybe sometimes you have to be a little braver than you have been as well. And all of those are elements of, uh, of making, having a good uh, development program for people. No, I think you're right. And there is a movement from the organizations responsible to some balance to the individual. And it takes time and effort and courage to, yeah. to do the different things or to speak out and say, I, you know, I want to develop myself to do it. So I, I, think, I think you said it perfectly. And on, on that, how, how can we as leaders ensure that that kind of deliberate approach that you're talking about, both in terms of succession planning and leadership development, is as inclusive as as possible yeah so for a business like ours when i think of diversity and inclusion and even our you know one of our culture principles which is all about being authentic um, it is that it has to be a place where everybody feels welcome it has to be it's a business imperative for us because we reflect you know all canadians we sell products to all canadians and so for us our workforce has to reflect you know the business and the people that we serve um, and so we want to be to be as inclusive as possible. So we have taken steps to ensure diversity across our business. We want our stores and our store management to reflect um, the communities we have. We want our products to reflect the communities that we serve as well. Um, and so we do have a very um, big uh, diversity and inclusion program. It of course includes um, women, but it also includes um, visible minorities. It also includes um, physical um, abilities as well. And of course, uh, sexual orientation as well. So I would say all types of diversity. And to me, it's like, I hate that we have these different pillars, but I feel like we need to at this point in time. I'd love to be at a place where we don't have to have these different pillars, but we focus on certain areas. But to me, it's like diversity of everything, diversity of where you come from, diversity of age, uh, whether you're young or you're old or you have tons of experience or little experience, you know, it's all that type of diversity, a place for everybody. Um, but we have also become metric based in this place. Um, I don't like to say that we have targets because that sounds bad, but we definitely have goals in terms of, you know, what we want to achieve. We are have started to um, describe to um, give a bit of a scorecard. So how are we actually doing on women in senior positions? How are we doing in terms of visible minorities in, in senior positions? So we are holding ourselves accountable to make sure that we do um, show people and we have that authenticity and that clearness and that clarity of this is how we're doing. This is where we think we're not doing well enough. This is where what we're focusing on. So very much um, in that, I would say from a, we are doing quite well. We have some women running, you know, big parts of our business. Um, aside from me, we have, uh, you know, our, a woman running our control brands now. We have a woman running our biggest division based on uh, on revenue. We have a woman running TNT. So we have lots of, you know, good examples as well. Our board of directors has five female directors right now. Um, and that represents 42% of our board. So we're getting there. Um, but, you know, you're never done on this journey. So it is uh, make, setting some goals. Um, being open to displaying your results um, and making clear as to you know what you're trying to achieve. That's what we're uh, that's what we're working on. No, you're never done, but you're certainly certainly leading the way at Loblaw, no question. Because it's 
hard to do and takes continuous effort uh, in this in, in this domain. And you're in a you're in a business where it maybe makes it a little harder in some cases, not necessarily easier. But uh, so kudos for that. Now, Sarah, with both grocery and pharmacy operations, your teams have been on the front line. I mean, the front line uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, which has you know, been spanning the better part of 10 months, soon to be 11. How has your culture really helped you navigate through these times? I think our ability to navigate the pandemic as well as we have, has had to do with the investments we've made over years in terms of culture and our commitment to the people and of course to our purpose, which uh, was really, really uh, critical. Um, we ended up hiring over 20,000 people um, during the first six months of the pandemic, um, which a lot of had to do with trying to um, really be available in terms of our digital products, which really you know tripled in size, and so we had a lot of uh, staff there. In some cases, it was people who you know weren't didn't feel comfortable coming to work, so we had to staff there as well. Um, and so I would say, from that perspective, we were we were really it was really important that people understood you know what it was to work for us and uh, and and through the pandemic as well. Um, so we did have you know lots of. Uh, you know, technology helped us out there. A central recruiting helped us out there too. Um, but I really do think our blue culture principles were well known amongst our colleagues, um, making connections, demonstrating authenticity and trust. Having those characteristics means we could weather it together. Um, and then I would say communications was really key. So certainly at the beginning of the pandemic, I actually wrote a note every single day to every colleague in our business. So 200,000 sent it out and then asked for sort of feedback on our social um, sites to be able to say, and basically explaining, this is why we're shortening store hours. This is why we're lengthening store hours. This is why we're requiring people to wear masks. This is why we're, you know, sanitizing carts. This is why we're putting up plexiglass. You know, this is why we're allowing seniors hours. This is why we're controlling the number of people in the stores and all of the changes that we made every single day um, throughout that, we basically wrote, I wrote it every day saying, this is what we're doing. This is the decision we made. This is why. And then we would have a feedback loop where the stores could say, you know what, that was a bad idea, <laughs> not working, <laughs> you know, or that was great. We feel like you, you know, you love us and you're listening to us. So whether it was good or bad feedback, we had that feedback loop. And I don't think we could have done it without the culture that we had in place where people felt like they could actually say if things weren't working the way and could be authentic and have those and uh, have this, uh, you know, ability to have this feedback and to feel responsive. So we really did all feel, and I would say from a management team, we met every day at noon, um, seven days a week, never and not once did anyone miss a meeting, um, no matter what. Uh, so people were really all in and every person, regardless of whether they were the finance person or the legal person or the regulatory affairs, they came prepared every single day at noon with, you know, the information they needed for their part of the business in order to, for us to make the best decisions we could. And then we communicated. Um, so super proud of how we came together as a team. We were never, you know, a big company. We've never been so agile. We've never been so responsive. Um, and I think the organization felt it. And for me, the culture, it, without the culture, I don't think we could have done it. And I mean, I think even now going forward with all working from home, the office people working from home, um, we wouldn't, people were saying, oh, are you ever going to go back to an office? And I said, absolutely we are, because I think our culture can't survive without us being together um, as well. And so it's great that we've been able to manage as well as we have from remote locations and having limited people. We can't have people going to stores all the time, spreading, going from store to store. You know, we didn't want that to happen through the pandemic. So we've had to sort of manage through that as well. And I don't think we could have done it without the culture we had built before, but we need to make sure that we keep it alive. And you do that by having that social interaction. So when we can, we will definitely all be together again. Let's look ahead beyond even the pandemic to maybe three to five years. What do you see as critical, Sarah, to aligning your people at Loblaw to your culture and to attracting and sustaining your high performance culture? So definitely consistency in messaging. So making sure that we all say the same thing. So that would communications to me. Um, is critical and it's proven how critical I never really realized the power of it um, as I did in 2020 so consistency there continued focus on the overall corporate purpose 
So really instilling that in everybody, every new hire that we have, every person across the business needs to understand what we're here for um, and making sure it resonates at all levels, that everybody understands their part um, in something that's, you know, big and great um, and how they can participate in that. Those would be sort of my, my three points there. Well, staying on the, on the kind of future, what, what trends do you foresee coming uh, in building high performance cultures? What's going to be critical to the future? Oh, well, I think it's everything that we've sort of hard to get out of, of the pandemic. So I would say, but definitely coming through that, it is communications, it's agility, adaptability, and of course, resilience. Um, and I think you know, we've taken some things and, you know, the businesses that have been able to, you know, work through this and, you know, some of them thrive through it. Um, people have been so creative in the way that they've been able to, uh, you know, keep businesses alive. So I think for us, we were lucky we're in a, you know, we're an essential service. So, you know, different for us, but I think even for us, we had to adapt the way things that we used to do. We had to adapt, we had to be agile, we had to make, be able to change quickly and we had to communicate. So I think those are going to be key for the next little while. Awesome. Last question. Uh, you've obviously been the, ben the beneficiary of great leaders before you, and now you're asked to develop and plan and you know, for succession and even mentor others. So if you're giving one piece of advice, Sarah, to the next generation of kind of high performance leaders, um, you know, who want to build and sustain a great culture, whether they be in a great organization like Loblaw, uh, in, in their own endeavor, what is that one piece of advice that you'd want them to keep close at, close at hand? Um, be brave and be comfortable being uncomfortable. So figure out how you can be comfortable being uncomfortable. Um, in this world of sort of uncertainty, um, you can't, you know, it used to be that you could sort of stay in your little shell and you could be, you know, feel this. And I think those days are done. And so you just have to figure out how can I be comfortable being uncomfortable? And I do think that when you wake up in the morning, and you don't have a little bit of that little churn in your stomach, you know, maybe not every day, but a lot of days it, it's, it means that you're, maybe you're not pushing yourself enough. So maybe, you know, just get used to that feeling, make sure that you feel that sense. And then you be, just become more resilient. You know, if you're uncomfortable being comfortable, some things, things will work. Sometimes they won't. You'll get used to that. Um, and then you'll be able to learn from there. So that, that's my advice. Be brave. Be comfortable being uncomfortable. Yeah. Well, you know what? We've all been a little bit uncomfortable in the last number of months. That's right. Even in the comforts of our own home. But it has certainly been a, an opportunity for us to grow and change. And I think under this purpose of live life well, that Loblaw has been an incredible innovator. Someone who's led change. Uh, has not in any way uh, kind of stayed the course uh, and, uh, and, and has really proven to be one of the great retailers, not just domestically, but I think you, if you could hold it up against most of the leading retailers globally. And, uh, and I think what's fueling it in more recent years is people like you who've spent so much attention to the culture and to developing the people, 11 to 12 people on the leadership team alone that you've developed. You're gonna put people like us out of business doing things. <laughs> like that. But in fairness, that, that, really is, uh, that really is a testament. And, uh, uh, and, and when you hear of leaders, and I know Michael McCain did it once a week for many, many years, that, but a note every day through very challenging times is, is also a big commitment um, and meeting as a team every day. And I think these are the kind of things that we're gonna take out of the pandemic through the leadership of people like you uh, and make us all better. So on that note, I wanna thank you very much for being our guest today, Sarah. Um, and, uh, and we wish uh, the, the future to be much bigger than the past for Loblaw Company Limited. And I know it will be for you as well. Well, thank you so much. It's been my pleasure. Cheers, everybody. Thanks, Sarah. Join us next week for another episode of Building High Performance Cultures. And in the meantime, if you want to learn more about the topic, please visit waterstonehc.com.